Hello, I'm Jeremy Barker, the director of the Middle East Action Team for the Religious Freedom Institute. The mission of RFI is uh, working to secure religious freedom for everyone, everywhere. And as a part of that, we've been doing a series of interviews to understand the impact of the COVID-19 crisis in the Middle East with a particular attention on vulnerable communities. And today I have the privilege to interview Nermeen Riyad, the founder and executive director of Coptic Orphans, a development organization that's been working in Egypt for over 30 years um, with a, a focus on fatherless children, but um, involved in, in many things in education and um, economic empowerment um, throughout Egypt. So it's a privilege to, to have Nermeen join me. And uh, Nermeen, Thank you so much for, for being a part of this interview series. Jeremy, it's always my pleasure. It's wonderful seeing you. Good to see you as well. Well, I know you're at the moment locked down with like many people in the US, um, but I know your your team and colleagues are, are busy at work in and throughout Egypt. Um, describe for us a little bit of what the impact of, of the COVID-19 um, crisis has been in Egypt over these last weeks? Yes, uh, well, as you know, uh, uh, Egyptians are in the same boat as many people in developing countries. And uh, with the global economy contracting so dramatically, uh, people's livelihoods are really hurting. Uh, and it's really sad to see uh, many people uh, being pushed back into uh, extreme poverty. Um, uh, countries that rely on trade and tourism uh, as a significant source of uh, income have been hit, I would say, hit the hardest. Uh, and Egypt, of course, is a prime example. Uh, tourism in Egypt make up, uh, makes up about 12% of its annual GDP. And uh, to add to that, of course, all the sectors that we've seen slow down here have also slowed down in, in Egypt. So uh, the coffee shops, the barber shops, uh, the microbus, and even the tuk-tuk drivers, well, they're not anywhere near the level of activity prior to the pandemic. And many, many people are losing their jobs. Now, if we look at how the poor have been affected, uh, it's really not that good news. Uh, many of Egypt's poor live in rural areas. And uh, while this may limit their exposure to the virus, uh, unfortunately, the locations where they are at also limits their access to uh, health services. And then on the flip side, the people living in Cairo who may have access to health, uh, health services, well, they're living in uh, populated areas uh, and they risk being infected uh, by their neighbors, you know, in these highly dense, uh, densely populated areas. Um, and then you have both rural and urban people are more than likely to be working in the informal sector, meaning uh, that they lack uh, social security and have little or no savings. Uh, it's uh, very disheartening to hear uh, the phrase, if we don't work, uh, we don't eat. Um, but to make matters worse, um, Remittance is also coming from the Gulf states um, that once kept families financially afloat, uh, they're drying up. And with many families, uh, their incomes going down, poverty is basically biting at their toes and children will suffer malnutrition. And just to give you one uh, data point, according to the 2019 Global Hunger Index, Malnutrition now is a growing public health concern for Egypt, with over 21% of children being uh, stunted. Uh, these are children under the age of five. Wow. So the, the situation in Egypt is tough at the moment, uh, but the government is doing the best that it can to meet the needs, uh, as well as the NGOs and charitable organizations. They're also stepping up. So we're hopeful that all these efforts can get Egypt to the other side of this crisis. Yeah, I think that's a, a useful overview. And, and this has certainly showed how many families and communities really live on, on almost kind of hand to mouth. Um, and so when you have that contract in, in day laborers or remittances, it, it's felt very quickly. Um, by those by those families you hit you touched a little bit on this but what are particular challenges that 
uh, minorities or other vulnerable communities in face. Uh, exactly. Uh, Jeremy, always vulnerable groups uh, end up suffering disproportionately uh, when it comes to crisis and, and such things. And uh, their sufferings are often uh, invisible in the, in the mass media. Um, so we're talking about what kinds of uh, vulnerable groups. We're talking about, of course, the poor. We're talking about the elderly, children, uh, individual with disabilities, and of course, women uh, of victims of abuse and, and such. So each of these groups really face a specific challenge uh, in this period. And we could say like the elderly, of course, for example, they may be feeling isolated and there be some um, uh, suffering of loneliness and depression uh, on top of already their health problems. And then also you have women that might find themselves trapped in, uh, in much closer quarters with an abusive partner. Um, but it's imperative that all of these groups, uh, like everyone, are able to receive the adequate support and resources to cope with this pandemic. Uh, I'd like to also mention about the Christians, which uh, the Christians in particular now have a unique challenge. And for the minority Christian community in Egypt, uh, the church is their place of refuge. I mean, it is the mother who protects them from whatever discrimination that they may be feeling outside. And for the churches to close its doors, the Christians to them feel that this is the, one of the greatest hardships. Um, and as you know, Holy Week, uh, this is the week uh, that all Christians look, uh, look forward to, uh, came during lockdown. And as one of my dear friends had said, uh, he was lamenting this and he's saying, it's easier to go without food than to go without the prayers of Holy Week. Yeah, the the timing of this has been really challenging, and it brings out these um, the impact that this has in the the relational realm, not just material impacts, but communal and and being cut off from the ability to worship, to gather with co religionists, and especially during during it. It's the, it's the very center of their community as well. So yes, it's a big deal for them. Yeah. Well. For you, as the executive director of development organization that's providing tangible assistance in many ways, um, how has this impacted your ability to work in in but urban centers as well? So, how, how has Coptic Orphans um, been able to work during this time? Well, uh, that's a wonderful question, uh, Jeremy, um, and. Basically, the way we see it is that we have the responsibility to take care of our children. And we recognize that COVID-19 posed a really big threat to our operation in Egypt. And we knew that we had to act quickly and that we had to adapt to the conditions that are on the ground. So firstly, what we did is we had to come up with some of innovative methods to stay in touch uh, with our 12,000 fatherless children throughout all of Egypt. And we had to meet their needs and, and do this while protecting everyone's health, uh, everyone that, that's involved in their health. And, and we knew also that the monthly financial assistance had to continue no matter what. Um, so that was the first thing. Then the second thing is um, since the, the volunteer reps couldn't go to them and to their homes as frequently as before, they instead began to use the phones to check on them and then also to regularly disseminate health and hygiene information, because that was a very important piece of, uh, of this puzzle. Um, and remarkably, in the past, we had done some extensive, extensive work around hygiene. And the idea of uh, teaching children rigorous hand washing was originally conceived as a preventive measure for hepatitis C. You know, Egypt has mm -hmm. one of the highest prevalence of hepatitis C. Um, but certainly all of this work that we had done in the past came in very handy um, to avoid the spread uh, of COVID-19. Um, so while the children are uh, waiting out the virus in their homes, Coptic Friends has um, made plans to ensure that they'll be able to continue their education. Schools have closed uh, for the rest of the academic year, 
and um, students are expected to complete uh, a research project uh, from mm -hmm. home in lieu of taking the year-end exams. But how can young children with illiterate mothers be homeschooled? And even for older children, you know, how you, this places a tremendous strain on them because they lack reliable internet. Mm -hmm. So we got right on it and we invested heavily in purchasing internet services uh, for remote learning. And we trained our volunteer reps to organize online tutoring sessions so that disadvantaged children are not left behind in this academic year. Wow, that's, yeah, some creative pivots of, of programs, but it, it highlights the, the value of the relationships and the, the networks that have been built before. Um, and even it's interesting, as you mentioned on kind of past work and hygiene, how that was able to, um, to be resurrected and applied to, to this issue as well. Um, as you look at the responses of whether local governments on the, the local level or the national level, NGOs, international organizations, um, what are recommendations that you would make for those actors for how they can um, more effectively assist communities um, as we see this, the impacts carrying on? Yeah, um, so one of the things that we do at Coptic Orphans is that we try to focus on building up our families' uh, self-reliance uh, and internal resources so they're not entirely dependent on the government, especially in moments of crisis. So naturally, where local governments can intervene positively by bringing goods and services to underserved communities, we definitely applaud that. Uh, the same is true for international organization. Uh, where there's hunger or a lack of other resources, really it takes a united effort by, by all of these actors. And I think that's the most important thing is that we all act together to, in the face of this pandemic. Yeah, those lines of communication are, are so important between communities, organizations, and and government leaders. And um, yeah, I think the um, the experiences have been been mixed of of which governments, which countries have have done a good job at opening lines of communication. Um, it, and it highlights the value of having engagement before a crisis. Yes. Um, hit that you have lines of communication and trust that's built that you can can draw on in a, a time of crisis like this. Um, as we kind of bring this to a close, any last points that you would want to, to highlight um, for, for our viewers? Actually, yes, thank you uh, for asking that. Uh, two things that I'd like to, to highlight. Um, first, I wanna say that I saw a lot of compassion uh, during these times. I've seen a uh, great, great generosity being directed to vulnerable groups. Uh, but the most heartwarming of it all um, are the kids. We're talking about the orphan kids. Uh, when they're hearing about <clears throat> the increasing uh, deaths in the United States, well, they're, <clears throat> they're worried about us. So mm -hmm. we've got kids um, messaging back to their sponsors saying, we want to see you. We want to make sure you're doing all right. We want to make sure you're okay. We're praying for you. So it's one of these really quite remarkable moments in which the tables have turned, and uh, it's the children more worried about their sponsors in the United States uh, than they're worried about themselves. So I thought that was that was really really uh, that was really sweet. And then I suppose the second thing that I'd like to say. Uh, is that um, we have to wake up every morning with the knowledge that families are growing hungry and that their children are uh, suffering from malnutrition. And this is a problem for today. Uh, it's not one that we can put off till tomorrow. And it's on all of our shoulders uh, to reach out to those that are most uh, impacted by the crisis. And just as COVID-19 can't wait uh, to claim its victims, well, we also can't wait uh, to protect and support our brothers and sisters. And so it's uh, imperative for all of us 
to act uh, towards this. That's yeah, that's an, an important point. It's it's something that really is urgent and and can't be put off. Well, Noreen, thank you so much for for speaking with me today to learn more about Coptic Orphans work. You can visit their website, copticorphans.org, and to, to learn more about the work of the Religious Freedom Institute, uh, you can find our website at rfi.org. Thank you again, Nermeen. Thank you, Jeremy. It's been a real pleasure.